Over to Ukraine right now, where President Zelensky is meeting with the Danish prime minister in the southern region of Mykolaiv. He's assessing damage from another round of Russian strikes, and this also is on the heels of the very big announcement from West, the Western allies that the West is sending in combat tanks to help Ukraine. And on the heels of that, Ukrainian leaders are now calling on allies to send fighter jets as well. Sam Kiley, he's in Kiev for us. Sam, what did you hear from Zelensky today? Well, he's renewed his uh, plea, and they really are pleas, for fighter jets and for long-range missiles, both of which the Ukrainians believe they need in order to continue to prosecute this war to try to rid their country of Russia, of Russian troops. Uh, and they also know that, uh, from the Russian perspective, if, the, if they can be outlasted by Russia, things are going to get extremely difficult for Ukraine. There's a consensus inside the Ukrainian government that over the next year they really do need to get to uh, victory. And victory, from their perspective, is the recapture not just of areas that the Russians invaded and are currently holding 11 months ago, Kate, but also that those areas, particularly the Crimean Peninsula, but the east of the country, that the Russians seized uh, with the help of Rus separatists back in 2014, 2015. So to do that, they need these strategic weapons. They're delighted that they're getting the tactical support in the form of tanks that the Ukrainian ambassador Paris says could number about 350. That is close to what the Ukrainians have been asking for in terms of tanks. They believe that the un unanimity in support of the donation and, and supply of tanks from NATO and other allies could mean that these more important strategic weapons, which so far have been denied them, particularly by the United States, might be forthcoming. Kate? Interesting. Great to have you there, Sam, as always. Thank you. Joining me now for some more perspective on this is Mark Esper, the former defense secretary under President Trump. Secretary, it's good to see you. Thanks for coming in. Let's start where Sam Kiley, what we were just talking about with Sam Kiley on the war in Ukraine. Tanks are on the way and a real show of unanimity around that delivery at this point. Ukraine is now asking for fighter jets as well to be sent. The German chancellor of the weekend said in no uncertain terms that is not going to happen. At least that's what he's saying now. Do you think the U.S. and allies should send fighter jets? Well, first of all, it's great that the allies finally got together and decided to send tanks to Ukraine. Uh, they've only been asking for a few months now and have needed them for quite some time, and they will be critical to either defending against a counter a Russian offensive in the spring or preferably launching their own counteroffensive. Now, with regard to the jets, I, absolutely, I think we should provide jets. Um, I, I still wonder what happened to the MiG-29s or so we were discussing 10 months ago. And so uh, the chancellor has said these things in the past. Other leaders have as well, that they won't get this technology or that to include President Biden. But look, we need to lean into this. We need to, we need to help Ukraine win, and they can win against the Russians. And to do that, they're going to need fixed-wing strike aircraft to help uh, conduct an offensive against the Russians and to push Russia out of Ukraine, to include Crimea. One of the things I know that you've talked about is just the, <clears throat> the time, kind of the, I'm just going to call it the, the, the lead time required with deliveries like this. You've talked about how the timing may be tricky with getting a, a, tanks in to Ukraine in time to when you're talking about the offensive and a counteroffensive, if you will. What about fighter jets? What, uh, what is that going to look like? Sure, absolutely. Look, I, I think that we've been behind the curve at each step of the way. Uh, you talk about HIMARS, we were behind the curve. We said we wouldn't and then Patriot and other air defense systems, and now tanks. I think this will happen inevitably. As such, why not begin training uh, German, I'm sorry, Ukrainian pilots on F-16s? Uh, it, it doesn't foreclose the fact that we may or may not in the end, but why not get ahead of that so that if a decision is finally made to provide, for example, F-16s, then the pilots are all ready to go. They're trained up. Uh, the technicians, uh, the maintenance crews are prepared as well. And so then it's just a matter of providing the jets, and they can be they can be ready to go within a, a, a matter of weeks. At this point, with regard to the tanks, it's going to take months, I'm afraid, to, to deliver them, to train on them, to be prepared to support them logistically and so on. And that just is insufficient given the timelines that we're up against. Yeah, the, the, the timeline is is real, that's for sure. And, they, and they've been talking about that, and that's why they're begging and pleading for months and months and months now. I want to ask you also about right. what Hadass Gold was just reporting for us. The Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, he's in Israel. He's speaking alongside the Prime Minister there. He's, Tony Blinken's mission, if you will, is to try to de-escalate the situation. How tough is that mission right now? 
Look, it's, it's very tough. You have a new government that's taking a, a really hard stance on these issues. And uh, you still have uh, the lingering tensions because of what's going on between in the West Bank and Israel. And then the broader context, which you didn't mention, but we know is out there, is Israel and Iran. We have, uh, you know, word of the attacks that happened against uh, some type of uh, Iranian facilities in Isfahan. Uh, we just in the past week had the largest uh, or one of the largest military exercises between uh, Israel and the United States. So there's the what's happening within Israel and then the broader regional context that all is impacting this new government right now. I want to add into this conversation the element of China into the, just the broader context of something that, it, that you, I know you are very focused on. NBC News and The Washington Post are both reporting that the head of Air Mobility Command for the Air Force, General Mike Minahan, wrote in a memo to officers and saying this in part, I hope I am wrong. My gut tells me we will fight in 2025. He's predicting that the United States will be at war with China in two years. Do you agree with that assessment? Well, you know, implementing the national defense strategy, which focused on China, was my top priority as Secretary of Defense. And uh, I read parts of General Manahan's letter. What I think he's trying to do is drive a sense of urgency within his command to, to, to uh, accelerate uh, whatever uh, things they're trying to achieve. I think that's very good that they're doing it. I think we need a broader sense of urgency within the entire Department of Defense. That said, I don't think war with China is inevitable. I wouldn't speak about it in those terms. I think we want to avoid war with China, but I think what he's looking at are the timelines. So one that that's, that probably has everybody's attention is the fact that uh, Taiwan will change, will have a presidential election in early 2024. A leading candidate for the Democrat Progressive Party is a, a, a pro-independence, uh, has taken a pro-independence position. It, it is things like that that could incite some type of reaction from Beijing. And I think he's looking ahead to that. So I, on one hand, I think it's very important to drive a sense of urgency. I applaud him for that. He's an aggressive commander. But on the other hand, I would not paint it as inevitable uh, that, that we will be in war. And I hope we can do everything we can to deter a conflict, but do so on our terms that we defend a young democracy, robust democracy like Taiwan, and preserve a free and open Indo-Pacific. And this folds into our discussion on Ukraine, of course, because if, 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 if China is watching very closely how everything in Ukraine is playing out, I know that, that, that you've, you see that and that's something you have suggested. What do you think Xi Jinping sees so far in how the United States and the West have reacted kind of in the collective? What's, what's the lesson to China here? Well, I think there are several lessons. First of all, in my view, uh, the Russia-Ukraine conflict is the opening fight in the much broader contest between autocracies and democracies in the 21st century, and China represents the greatest threat to that. I think what he should see is that uh, maybe his military isn't as pre prepared as they think they are or that they are telling him. That is certainly true with Vladimir Putin and his generals. I think he should be very concerned, secondly, about the ability of a skilled, uh, resolute people a, uh, with a smaller economy, a smaller country, a smaller military to defend themselves against a much bigger foe and neighbor. And I'm glad to see that Taiwan is, is finally taking a number of decisions that will help improve their self-deterrent capability as well. And then thirdly is the broader political issue that the West is acting together. And the West being not just Europe and NATO, but uh, many of our uh, partners in, in Latin America, uh, certainly India, uh, I'm sorry, certainly uh, uh, Japan and Korea and Australia and others are standing up to help defend Ukraine against the Russian aggressor.